Hello and welcome to the AuthorTube Writers Conference. I'm Morgan Hazelwood, and today I'm sharing better beta reading. So if we go and we look at the schedule, you'll see the description. Um, but if you look at the YouTube, you'll see I changed it just a little. Um, so say you've asked or offered to beta read for someone, or maybe you're the one looking for beta readers. As the writer, where do you find them and how do you get the feedback you're looking for? As a beta reader, what if they don't tell you, what sort of feedback are they looking for? And of course, how do you give feedback that helps and still be on speaking terms with the author after they've read your comments? So that's what I'm gonna be addressing today. And uh, thank you everyone who came. I see uh, Maggie is here, hello. Angela is here. Victoria, hello and welcome. Margaret, thanks for coming. Anna, hello. Fiona, excellent. SD, hi, I'm so glad you made it. Um, okay, and that's who said hi, but if you're lurking, that's totally fine. You don't have to say hi, you can hang out and lurk. So let me go ahead and get started. Better beta reading for the AuthorTube Writing Conference 2023. <sighs> so before we even get into how to become a better beta reading, let's make sure we're all on the same page. So what is a beta reader? Well, they're a reader who reads your story and gives you feedback after you've edited it and before you turn it into your teacher or your publisher or self-publish, whatever your path is. Now, some people have alpha readers for before they edit or before they finish editing or critique partners who are other writers who exchange stories and feedback with you. But all of those generally fall under the beta reader uh, umbrella. You know, you can have all sorts of people be your readers. Uh, for me personally, I my alpha reader is my twin sister. So we both enjoy a lot of the same stories, a lot of the same books, and she's both an English major and ha just got her master's in library science. So she not only has all of my context and preferences, but she also on the academic side has a decent background to give me some feedback. She can let me know if my story is working and doing what I intended to do, but she can't necessarily tell me if people who have a different context than me are going to follow it because it's like me reading it without having written it. It's, it's a little bit of a cheat. So uh, do you have a beta reader? Do you have a critique partner? Do you use an alpha reader? What is your preference? Do you like all of these? Let me know. So next up, da -da done. How would you beta read? When you go to beta read, do you have a particular method you follow? Are there questions you ask? Does your author give you questions? What goes into your beta reading process? Does anybody want to answer? <laughs> I'll give you a moment to think about it. And hello, Joan. Thanks for joining. Well, I'm going to go into my approach. My method for beta reading is, first of all, ask the writer what feedback they're looking for. Um, and then once I get a feel for what sort of things the author is looking for, I like to, I use Google Docs, I'm cheap, um, and it's compatible with both Word and any of the open office um, knockoffs like the Mac version and the Linux version. So I like to open the document in suggestion mode, not edit mode, so they can see all of my suggestions and accept them or not. Uh, I add notes or corrections when I'm confused or something's not working for me. 
I like to add notes to applaud well-written sections. If I start talking to your characters like, oh no, they didn't, then you have passed my editor brain into my reader brain and you haven't kicked me back out. The story is working great if I'm responding to your characters and your story and not the quality of the writing. And I'm working on becoming a better developmental editor by summarizing general feedback for the characters, the pacing, or the voice. So for those who are unfamiliar, developmental editors look at the pacing, they look at the story arc, they look at, do you have too many characters? Is it confusing? Is it not complex enough? All of those things, and they, they bring it together. They look for plot holes and that sort of thing. The easier side for a lot of people is to, this word or sentence is confusing at the copy editor line edit version, where it's easy to give feedback as you're following along about what's not working right now, rather than as a big picture. And so both levels of feedback are very helpful for a writer, depending on what they're looking for. But um, I personally, I'm trying to grow my developmental edits. Um, unless otherwise asked, I will put in line edits. I can't not. Okay, I can. If you specifically ask me not to line edit, I will hold back and just make the line edits mentally and move on from there, unless the sentence is really confusing. Um, some people tend to want to try and make your sentence grammatically correct or literary or what have you. Um, and a lot of times that really is their own voice or what they've been taught in school and not necessarily things you need to follow because everyone's voice is different. And just because an item is not grammatically correct, it doesn't mean it doesn't work for the voice or the character or the story. So it's up to you to really look into that. So um, popping into the comments, uh, let's see some approaches for Angela. Angela likes to ask if there's anything that's not necessarily their strong suit that they want Angela to pay attention to. So perhaps they're bad at description and they have white room syndrome where they're in a blank space, or maybe they think their dialogue tends to be very stilted or everyone sounds the same and that kind of thing. So yeah, definitely. Uh, let's see. Maggie says beta reading one's own work because we know the world and our readers don't. I don't know if it, I, I think it's just editing if you read your own work to, um, and give yourself feedback. I don't know if I would qualify that as beta reading, but yeah. Uh, Maggie likes to ask for favorite characters and least favorite world bu building fit. Nice. Okay. I like those. So Victoria has always gotten chapter by chapter questions to answer for the people uh, they better beta read for. Okay. Uh, for SD, uh, SD asks alpha and beta readers who or what uh, her book reminded them of for comp titles. Ooh, make, make your beta readers, alpha readers do that work for you and then ask them for their favorite lines for marketing purposes. Ooh, I might have to steal that one. Uh, let's see. Angela uh, says, writing without sounding negative, I often ask, is there anything in particular you want me to watch out for? Often they'll tell me their weak spots. So I think sometimes if you say, hey, can you watch out for a particular thing? you might be worried about it, but the reader might not notice unless they're looking for it. So you might be priming them to look for that. So that's a judgment call on your part. So let's see. <laughs> Nicole says uh, they have such white room syndrome. I get it. I care about what's happening and how the characters are feeling. I don't really mind if the room is brown or yellow unless the cat decides to leap at me, you know? So uh, let's see. And Nicole likes to ask what questions they have 
and what they think is going to happen at different stages. Yeah, definitely. Those are all great, great questions. So, okay. Next up, let's talk about what sort of feedback you want. And I think most of y'all just answered those questions because as writers, there's a lot of things we really want to know. And I, I have one rule about beta reading above all others. It's like the zero rule, which is in order to get the feedback you're looking for, ask for it. That's the best way to get the feedback you want. So uh, let's see. Here are my eight questions you can ask your beta readers. Obviously, we all have our own preferences, but uh, some people like a lot of feedback from the very get go when they're just drafting page one. And some don't want anyone to see it until they can't polish it anymore. Personally, I do a zero draft. I read through it to make sure it's coherent and then I send it off to my alpha reader. And that's that's my process, but everyone has their own process that works for them. And remember, just because your process worked for one book doesn't mean it's gonna work for the next book. So it's okay to change things up, even if it worked before, because you're never in the same place in your life, you're never writing the same story. And so being flexible is really helpful. So here are the types of questions I like to ask my beta readers. Now, most of them never fill out a survey or anything like that. But by presenting these questions up front, it lets my reader know what sort of feedback I'm looking for. So as they read through and add those suggested comments, these are the sort of things that their brain has been primed to look for. So the questions I like to ask are, did the story capture your interest from the beginning? Was there a point at when your interest started to lag? Like, when did you put down the book? Because you needed a break, not just because it was time for work or bed or what have you. Were there parts that confused, frustrated, or annoyed you? Maybe they're supposed to. It's great to hear if it's working, but if it's not intended to frustrate the reader, that's very useful to know. Were there any conflicting details? Maybe I switched around plot elements in the storyline and things just aren't progressing. But it's good to know if I forgot a detail and they remembered it. Uh, question number five I like to ask is, were the characters and dialogue believable? In the current story, I am editing. Uh, I call it my space fantasy. I have a character who is three years old and one of my beta readers told me that her dialogue was completely unrealistic. And I'm reading through my story and I'm like, that sounds like a three-year-old to me. And then I get to one scene and there's one, maybe two lines in which are way too mature for that one character. And that's what stuck with the reader's head. So even if you have a very believable character, if they do one or two lines that are very out of character, that can really spoil that one character for the entire book for that reader. So it's really, really useful. Uh, the sixth question I like to ask is, was there too much of something? Narration, narrative, dialogue. I know personally, I like to stay in the... Uh, main character's head. I like to know what they're thinking and feeling and all that sort of stuff. And sometimes I forget to act or speak or describe the room because that's not important for the plot. So I often have to go back in and add that or break it up some. I have done some beta reading for a dear friend of mine who is an artist. And sometimes after the fourth paragraph of describing a room, I tell her that, hey, we need the character to walk around the room or talk or something during this beautiful description of a room because I'm getting kind of bored and antsy here. <laughs> Even though it's very well written, if you have too much of something without breaking it up, it can be really, um, your reader's gonna start to skim. Uh, so my seventh question is, was the ending satisfying? This is one of the most important things I feel for a story. If 
the ending does not fulfill the promise of the beginning, then I don't want my story to go out with a whimper. I want it to go out with a bang. I want people to be like, wow, that really, you know, hit hard or, you know, was very fulfilling, whichever. But knowing that you have a good solid ending is really key. Even if your book is in the series or is a sequel, you want to make sure that it can stand alone and that it feels like they've reached at least a breathing point in this narrative. And finally, did you really connect with any of the story elements? I like to hear what's working, not just what's not working. You want to make sure that you either do more of it or leave it alone if it's working for all of your beta readers. So definitely, definitely ask for the things that aren't working, but ask for the things that are, because that's, I, I find knowing that something is working for my reading really invigorating and it helps me power through the hard parts. So uh, let me pop into the comments and see what other people are thinking. So yes, Angela wants to know where the readers hit the speed bumps, where the confusion, annoying, uh, frustration being parts. So um, uh, Nicole says, beta readers are great at picking things up. So true. And Nicole's work in progress, the main character is a violinist and the poor beta reader kept saying, where is her violin? What happened to it? Because the character would have the violin and then go on an adventure. <laughs> uh, agreed. We all get caught up in the adventure and forget the details sometimes. So, so yeah, they're, they're very, very important things mm -hmm. to do. So next up, let's talk about what I like to call shamelessly Morgan's rule of thirds. All feedback that you get on your story is going to fall in one of three categories. It's going to be the easy fixes. Maybe these are typos. Maybe your reader was confused, but that's because you missed one little detail early on. So if we make it more clear, it'll be obvious why this had to happen. Uh, the second type of feedback are the hard fixes, the things you think you thought you fixed, but really you just slapped a coat of paint over a rotten uh, windowsill, like a bad landlord. Totally hypothetical situation here. Um, and these, these are the hard stuff where if you don't know how to fix it. It's a plot hole. It's, you know, a world building detail that isn't fully fleshed out. It's your character acting in a weird way and you know why, but it's hard to explain and that sort of thing. It's, it's just hard. And my, the third option are when the beta reader is just wrong. Sometimes they give you feedback and it came out of left field and you're like, how, how did they get there? I had one beta reader who gave me amazing feedback. I really liked a lot of their stuff, but on page three, I have the somebody insults the aliens by calling them octos and say that the aliens hate it being compared to those earth octopus creatures. And one page later, she says, I really can't picture your aliens. It would be helpful for you to compare them to a an earth species. And I don't know how to make it more clear without saying they looked exactly like octopuses, but with eyes on stalks. But I felt like it was completely spelled out and maybe the reader had just taken a break and come back to it and it wasn't fully cemented in their head. I don't know what happened, but sometimes your reader is just wrong. And so that doesn't mean you should completely ignore what they said. While beta readers are usually good at recognizing when things aren't working, their suggestions on how to fix the problem are usually hit or miss. So maybe it was clear, but maybe I could have made it more clear what they looked like or their height or something like that. 
maybe I could set it up better so the confusion doesn't happen. But yeah, beta readers are pretty good at knowing what's not working and eh, not so great at telling you how to fix it. Although a lot of people do like to offer suggestions for both line edits and for plot issues. I once got a 3,000 word um, email to go along with a beta reader feedback from a writer friend of mine in which 2,000 maybe more words were spent on how they would have taken my world setting and created weapons with the magic. Um, and while that wasn't the direction I wanted to go, I realized that humans are involved and therefore I should at least do some sort of defense mechanism with the magic I had available. And so I did incorporate their feedback, but I kind of ignored all of their personal world, worlds building because that wasn't the direction. Remember, it's your story. You get to decide how to fix all your, your character's issues. So um, yeah, popping into the comments, Maggie agrees. Beta are good at finding the holes as <laughs> we think we filled. And uh, it's that we were even reading the same book critique moment definitely happens. Uh, SD says a lot of betas are just readers, not writers. Uh, so I think they may not be the right one to listen to when it comes to writing advice, but still useful to hear what they have to say if you can figure <laughs> if you can figure it out. Yeah. So Maggie says snail head eyed cephalopod heads. <laughs> Nicole once had someone think a contemporary sort of women's fiction scene uh, and thought it was gothic horror. And Nicole realized they needed to be more explicit in the scene. Hello, Elaine. Elaine says, making sure your beta readers are readers in your genre is important too. Yeah. Uh, Elaine had someone ask to read their book and they gave them feedback. And that's when they found out the reader does not read romance. Yeah, that, that can be hard. Some people want to have that mainstream crossover. So knowing what works for someone who's not necessarily a reader of your genre can be useful. But if they're complaining about things that are tropes within your genre, I think it's, it's fine to ignore those items. So... SD says that one of her alpha readers said she was a writer too and rewrote one of her chapters to add a sex scene and said, I was taking too long and it needed to happen. Um, I, yeah, that's, that's a unique take and probably not a beta reader I would work with again. Uh, Maggie says, make sure your beta readers have feelings about things you do. If your beta reader or editor doesn't believe in therapy, having the main character in therapy uh, became a point of contention between Maggie and one of her betas. So, oh. So, yeah, CM Clark agrees with Elaine, making sure they're in your genre is the first thing to ask before allowing someone to beta read. Uh, Elaine learned her lesson. So, uh, Fiona says, this is why I'm a bit nervous about giving my work to beta readers when it's done. Uh, Fiona is close to finishing and needs to get over that nervousness soon. So for that, I would say one of the things you can do when looking for beta readers is to give them a sample chapter. This allows you to find out what sort of feedback they have, whether their feedback really um, follows your vision for the story, how quickly they respond and all that sort of thing. And if they're not a good fit, you can just say, thank you. That was helpful. And just not ask them to read any more pages. So definitely test it out. Don't commit to a full story if you don't know if you're going to really mesh as, as reader and writer. So yes, a hundred percent. SD says, remember, someone is taking their valuable time to read your work, even if they're rewriting it. 
Esty thanked that alpha reader for their time. <laughs> so yes, sample chapter, definitely. So let's go into our next thing. Feedback is hard. What are some of the good ways to respond to feedback, even if they're wrong? And what are some bad ways to respond to feedback? I think we just got a couple stories there. Um, I have a friend who gave some beta reader feedback and they were asked if English was even a language they were fluent in, which I believe is one of the most racist things I have ever heard. And yes, this person was very fluent and that is not a way to respond to feedback. So uh, let's see. Uh, SD says the person who rewrote their scene, they would not take them as a reader in the future. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So Angela asks, what if you get a beta reader that doesn't quote unquote find anything and you know they're a voracious reader? Some people are just going to say, oh, I liked it or I didn't like it. And that's decent high level feedback. Um, they didn't see any glaring holes. There was nothing that kicked them out of the story. So it says you have a good read, but it's not actually getting you any feedback you can use. So I would say, thank you so much. And then in the future, be like, I'm so glad you're supportive. I'd love for you to read the final published draft so that you um, can really enjoy it without evaluating what changed and all sorts of things. Because I, I have a lot of friends and family who are readers who, you know, majored in English, are storytellers themselves, that sort of thing. And so sometimes I have had more beta readers than I wanted. And I don't want everyone who's excited about my book to be a beta reader because I, I do want someone when the book comes out to be able to just enjoy it. If they were a beta reader or an alpha reader, they're going to be like, oh, why didn't you fix this? Why is this still here? Why did you change that? And they're not going to be enjoying the book at the same level. And so it's, it's useful to hold people in reserve. Also, when I'm selecting beta readers, I like to get people from different backgrounds. I don't want five middle school English teachers who grew up in suburbia I want some gamers and some writers and um, some readers who don't have any educational background and different genders and all sorts of different backgrounds so that I have different perspectives on the work. Um, one thing I like to do is I like to have no more than five to seven beta readers tops. I like an odd number because that way if um, with two people, you can't really get perspective because it's not enough opinions. They could totally disagree. They could totally agree on stuff. If they both agree, you're probably fine following that advice, but different readers get different things. So to me, three to seven is probably the sweet spot. I think too many opinions is very distracting for me. Um, and another thing I like to do is I like to send out, everybody has their own individual copy. Some people like a more collaborative approach. I prefer having separate copies because that way one person who's very opinionated, who goes first, isn't going to influence everyone else's feedback. So that way I, I have unique um, feedback from, from everyone. And that way I can see if there's certain trends rather than everyone just following the stronger voice. So, uh, yeah, there's Maggie asks, do you have a minimum and maximum number of beta readers? Yeah, I think, I think three is probably my minimum, but yeah. So, <laughs> Uh, popping back into the comments. Let's see. CM says, as a beta reader, if you feel like something has to be written, give a reason, but don't rewrite it. Explain why it needs to be rewritten. Yeah. 
Nicole says the sample chapter is important. When I beta read, it's got to resonate. Definitely. Uh, Angela says that one of their beta readers was a librarian when they first connected. Awesome. So let's see. Estes had an alpha reader that said her story was good. And SD asked for specific questions, asked specific questions for areas that she needed help with, but the reader had nothing to offer. So then I asked her who her favorite character was and why, and asked who was her least favorite and why, and she was able to at least answer those questions. Uh, some people just don't want to say anything negative. Uh, so sometimes phrasing the questions positively can help. Thank you. Yes. So Maggie asks, what do you think of those who suggest getting at least one reader outside of the genre to give feedback? I think that's super helpful if you are looking for crossover appeal. I think um, as long as they're open to different genres, it can be useful. But if they're very entrenched in literary fictions, you know, tropes or uh, horror writing tropes or romance tropes. If they only read one genre, it's going to be a lot harder. If they read more broadly, I think it, it'll work a lot, lot easier. So yeah, Fiona agrees. Phrasing questions positively is a great idea that can get more specific results. So Here are some ways to respond to feedback. Getting feedback is super hard. Even award-winning professionals can take a few days to get from, they didn't understand my brilliance to, mm, maybe I could have set it up a little better. I was at a panel on getting feedback with Connie Willis of To Say Nothing of the Dog, and she said she goes through this process with her own writing and her own writer's group. So it was really encouraging to know that even professionals struggle with taking feedback, but do take feedback from other readers and writers. So that was super helpful. Here are some ways to react and some responses to avoid. Number one, don't take the feedback personally. It's all about the reader and their expectation management. It's not about you and your story. Secondly, read the feedback thoroughly. They took the time to read through it and do all this work. And usually not even for a batch of cookies, just out of the goodness of their hearts. Although if they're sensitivity readers, you should definitely be paying them if you can. If not, if only in exchange. Um, thirdly, don't expect them to know how to fix everything. Even if it's a professional editor, they don't know your world, your characters, and your story like you do. Just because they've given you good feedback doesn't mean they know how to fix it. And thank them. Always thank them for their feedback, no matter how garbage it is. They took their time and energy, and they gave you feedback. So some ways to avoid responding. Don't argue with a beta reader about why they're wrong. I struggle with this one a lot. I want to justify everything I did. I'm like, oh, but they did that because of this. Because I know why it happened. Arguing isn't going to change anything unless the beta reader asked the question, in which case maybe a little justification is allowed. But generally, you just want to set it up a little better. Um, as I said before, you don't want to question their grasp on the English language just because they gave you feedback you don't like. Um, another big don't is don't slam their work just because they gave you feedback you didn't like. Some people are very vindictive, and that's part of why I hesitate from reviewing books that I'm not going to give a four or five star to is because some re writers out there will have their street team come after you if you give them anything less than a five-star review. They're very hostile and vindictive, and you never know when someone is going to act like that. You can think you know people, and then that comes. So I, I am very wary of public reviews, um, and I am, I think, pretty 
choosy about who I do do beta reading for. So make sure that's why you want to do that sample chapter because if you do a full novel and they really don't like how hard hitting your feedback is, then that's going to escalate stakes in ways neither of you are really going to enjoy. And finally, don't assume that an edited story will automatically guarantee you a big dollar book contract. That takes skill, timing, and luck, and you can only control one of those three things. So let me go ahead and pop back to the comments. Let's see. Oh, Maggie asks, are beta readers and sensitivity readers the same thing? They are not. Um, sometimes sensitivity readers or people who could be sensitivity readers will offer to beta read, which is one thing. But a sensitivity reader is specifically looking for a particular aspect, usually part of their own identity and making sure that those elements in your story ring true. If they're a wheelchair user, if they're from a particular minority group, that sort of thing. Um, maybe they're in the military and you want to make sure that the military aspects ring true. These are people who are bringing subject matter expertise, their lived experience, and they're applying it to your story to make it more realistic and to make sure that the nuances that someone who just hasn't lived through it are going to miss. Like you can do all the research in the world. You can do all the imagining you want. We are very creative and imaginative and empathetic people as writers, but we all have blind spots and having someone who's been in those shoes is very helpful to, to make sure that because we don't know what we don't know about somebody else's lived experience. So if you're writing about that, having a sensitivity reader and showing them that you value their time, either through money or exchange of services, read for them, that sort of thing. Um, maybe give them a published book, whatever the exchange value that they put on their time, but value other people's time and work. Um, so, so they can be beta readers. Uh, as well, but sensitivity reading is a very niche um, and it's hard. It's hard because these are, they're not just reading for fun. They're reading to see how their identities have been used on the page. And that can be a very, very draining thing on the sensitivity reader, which is why you really want to uh, value their expertise. So let's see. JK struggles with taking the feedback personally. I, it's so hard. The knee-jerk reaction is so hard. But JK tries to refrain from commenting unless they have a question about the story or character. Yeah. Just say thank you and either take their feedback or not. So Nicole says on the refraining, uh, Nicole has heard editors and agents say they won't talk about feedback with their authors until after they sat with it for a week or so. Yeah, and these are professionals. Professional editors and agents with professional writers give their writers a week to think over the feedback. So it's universal. It's okay if you struggle with it. We all do. So um, I will circle back to Victoria's question. Uh, CM says, I have a hard time sending in some of the beta reads I do, more so when I have to end up explaining basic grammar. Yeah, that can be hard. I know some people um, really struggle with grammar, and it can be really hard to read for, for those of us, especially with more of a grammatical background. Often for those, I will correct something throughout the first chapter and then stop correcting it and just say, do a universal fix on this. If the grammar is going to be a problem for you, that sample first chapter edit is going to find that out. And you could say, hey, you've got to work on your grammar. And it's I, I'm sure you're going to get there, but I'm not the right copy editor for you. You need somebody else to, to help you at that level. Um, I have a friend who is a writer who is blind. And so it's really hard for her to see the grammatical and the punctuation and stuff like that. So she needs another person to help her with the editing. And, um, you know, that's not her fault in any shape or form. But 
depending on the person, is how much patience do you have for that grammar level editing? So JK says, when JK beta reads for someone, they usually adhere to the compliment sandwich. One compliment, something they need to work on, and a compliment again. I sometimes go for that, but I, I'm looking for things I like and things I don't like. I try not to be like, here's a criticism, but let me smother it in nice things as well. Um, I, I try to be a little more organic and not quite formulaic when I do that. Um, but yeah, definitely, especially if you know they're sensitive or there's a lot of negative feedback. So uh, Nicole says, do we differentiate between sensitivity readers and like expert readers? Um, I, I consider sensitivity readers a type of subject matter as experts. So if you were going to ask a nuclear physicist to read over the nuclear physicist scenes and that sort of thing, I would find a sensitivity reader at that same level. So <laughs> yes, Dal is in fact amazing. So um, let's see. Yeah. Uh, Victoria says the uh, compliment sandwich works really well for verbal feedback. I think it can also work really well in the high level email. Like if you're emailing back and saying, hey, I finished here, you know, some things I found that I wanted to give you high level feedback uh, separate from the inline comments. That's a good place to, to do the compliment sandwich. So, um, OK, so moving back, I said I was going to come back to it. Uh, Victoria asked uh, to me to talk a little bit about how to find beta readers. Let's see, what's my next slide? Yes, that's where we are. So to find beta readers, um, obviously you can find beta readers in writing groups, although some of those I think qualify almost as critique partners, which is a type of beta reader, but writers are coming at it from a craft perspective, um, from a professional perspective and not just as readers. And so it's gonna be a little different. They're gonna be more about many of them, not all of them are gonna be more about uh, pacing and uh, plot structure and grammatical sort of things rather than how does it read to someone at a less craft perspective. Um, so, Obviously, friends and family, writing groups are great places. Um, there's Twitter pitch events, although I know Twitter is a little problematic right now. I, I find a really great place to find critique partners is when you look for groups um, online, communities of writers who are ready to query their writing because if they're at the stage where, or publish their stuff, because if they're ready to share it with the world, if they think it's ready to be traditionally published, then they're not just people who, oh, I'd love to write a book one day. And here's three pages I have on 12 different books and I haven't actually ever finished anything. While writing for yourself is totally fine, that I'm, I'm not demeaning that at all. I'm just saying that people who have gone through the full process of a full manuscript are going to have more insight into that whole pacing thing. Um, so um, writing groups, asking on, on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, a lot of, I've seen TikTok people looking for, for beta readers as well. So it's, it's easy to, there's a lot of place to ask. I would definitely have a good one or two line pitch. Um, you can also join your professional group um, not all of them allow people to become full members, but you can often join like the forums and stuff like that for if you write mystery, the mystery writers group or the romance writers group. A lot of them are very supportive. Um, another place you can look for beta readers is, um, let's see, does, does anybody in the audience have suggestions for that? Uh, oh, the other difference with critique partners is critique partner partner implies you exchange your work. So you're doing reading for them as well. So that's, that's another place. Yes. Yes. Angela says savvy authors offers pitch sessions and critique partner pair ups. <clears throat> so 
Uh, JK asks, uh, how do I beta read for someone? I went into this a little bit at the beginning, but I basically use my own beta reader questions for if I don't, I'm not given feedback or questions from the author. And I like to open up in a Google Doc and I'll do inline comments. And I'm working on being better at giving a short sentence or two at the end of each chapter to let the author know how it worked for me. I'll point out um, sentences that are confusing, plot points that jump around. Um, wolves in the savanna of Africa was a little confusing for me. I thought they should be a different animal. Uh, that sort of thing. But I'll also start talking to your characters. Oh, no, are you okay? <gasps> they didn't. And when I start talking to your characters, your story is working for me. So so that's how I like to give feedback. I do it uh, in Google Docs with suggestions. And I've done that for people who use Word. I've done it for people who use Scrivener. I've done it for people who use the Linux open faux Word Libra office thing. Um, and my suggestions have opened up fine for them because I'm cheap. And I know some people do struggle with Google Docs, especially for longer documents. I found if you click that work offline, it doesn't auto sync as often. And so a lot of the lag disappears if, if you just select that option. So let's see. Uh, popping to the comments. Uh, Angela says that Discord has a beta reader pool, um, but I don't have the link either. So, hey, Mr. Blendis. Um, JK uh, found their beta reader through advertising their work in progress on Twitter. Yeah. Um, CM said, we need to make a beta reader pitch via Facebook uh, now that Twitter is strange. Yeah, I've seen plenty on uh, Facebook, um, different writing support groups and stuff like that actually have those. Uh, Nicole says, uh, has an amazing uh, critique partner. Uh, they found through hashtag ref pit plus from a writing conference where they critiqued each other's queries. So yeah. And Maggie says, don't forget to check out the uh, author tube writers conference sponsor fictionary. <laughs> um, so Mr. Vlandis says, yeah, finding betas has been hard. I'm sorry. And everyone's always looking for betas when I'm deep in edits and don't have time. So I, I totally get it. Um, if you're interested in becoming betas, comment on this YouTube and we'll see if we can do a matchup and see if anyone uh, here sounds like they'd be a good fit. Obviously, exchange information, do that sample chapter, make sure you're a good fit. It doesn't mean that you're not going to be an amazing beta reader for someone else just because you're not a good fit for a particular person. So um, I think, let's see, what are some of the other places I found beta readers? Yeah, yeah, I mostly hit up my friends and family network. And now um, as my writing community is growing, I can usually find someone through there. Uh, my current roommate, I <laughs> used as one of my beta readers. So that was, and she might make some fan art. So I'm kind of excited about that. <laughs> yes, 100%, Maggie says, if you promise a beta swap and they read yours, definitely read theirs. So uh, if you don't want to commit, make sure you do that first chapter to make sure that it's a genre and storyline that works for you. I know that there are some people who um, there are certain subjects and things that they would like to read, but just are emotionally, they're not in the right place for. And so knowing that going in can let you know whether or not you can commit to a story. So hello, Rita says they would love to be a beta reader and are looking for one young adult and fantasy. Even a critique partner would be awesome. Um, oh, actually, Rita said critic partner. Uh, I like to call them critique partners, not critic partners, because I, I feel critics tell you everything wrong with something. And a critique is more full, but 
Google might, uh, dictionary might, might tell me I'm wrong on that one. So Anna is uh, open to becoming a beta reader. So definitely exchange information and reach out to each other. Um, okay, well, I have, that's all the information I have right now. Let me know if you have any other questions. I talk a lot about beta reading and querying and the whole writing process over on my uh, blog and my YouTube and my Facebook. And um, I do uh, live stream productivity sprints every Sunday afternoon from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. Um, so, and I have a podcast called Writing Tips and Writerly Musings. I like to attend uh, science fiction and fantasy conventions, fan run ones rather than media run ones. And then I attend every writing panel I can and I take notes and I share those on my blog. So I have writing tips from the pros and of course my own writerly musings over there. So, um, oh, Angela says, remember to fill out the feedback form for your chance for prizes. I don't have any prizes, but many of the other author tube writers conference um, panelists have books and uh, services available. So that's super exciting. <laughs> Maggie says Sunday foodie sprints. Yes, my my uh, writing sprints are 100% snack fueled. So. So I'll just leave the line open if anyone has any more questions or we can just hang out. What is everybody working on? Tell me about your stories. Uh, I'm working on a space fantasy right now. It's a, um, let's see, what's, what's my tagline? Uh, so in a world where humans sail the aether between solar systems, one woman must determine what she's willing to give up in order to return to the stars. One woman wants to heal her broken family and an alien captain would rather swim through the challenges of the stars than face the dangers of her home ocean. It's a retelling of Vasilis of the Brave, um, and it's got three points of view. So with with space manta rays that pull uh, nautiloid ships through the voids of space and humans sailing on the aether between solar systems. It's just visually stunning, um, even though I'm not usually a very lyrical writer. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. Uh, Margaret says uh, they are also a snack powered writer. Uh, JK is working on a bakery rivals to lovers work in progress projects, sugar and spice. Oh, nice. Uh, let's see. SD says, asks, what are best practices in wrapping everything up with your beta readers? Um, I like to read through. Generally, any of the open questions they have are going to be in the email. So once I finish a beta read or my beta readers finish, they usually email me to let me know. They usually tell me they really enjoyed it because they're very sweet and thoughtful people. And then they'll give me uh, some of their feedback and I will respond with an email saying, thank you so much, or maybe a Facebook messenger. Um, and I'll answer any of their open questions, but otherwise uh, I, I try not to delve too much into the nitty gritty as I go through the editing. Although with my roommate, I have bounced a few things off of her, so. Uh, let's see. Elaine says, if Pirates of the Caribbean and The Prince's Bride were primarily romances, you'd have the story Elaine is editing right now. That sounds super fun. And let's see. Maggie is still hoping to push live on the publish of How to Become a Crazy Cat Lady to Survive the Zombo Apocalypse on July 2nd. Ooh, that sounds super fun. You, you've got like two weeks. I'm sure you've got this. I'm sure you've got this. So. I'm trying to think if there's anything else with wrapping up with your beta readers, but I, I, I don't think so. I think you think them and I, 
I did once get a $20 um, gift card from someone I beta read for. So if your budget allows, that never goes awry. <laughs> uh, so um, Angela is working on a contemporary romance with a military focus. And Victoria is working on a middle grade realistic contemporary where the protagonist's biggest fear is middle school. Oh, yes. Uh, Fiona loves the title for Maggie's How to Become a Crazy Cat Lady to Survive the Zombo Apocalypse. Because it's hilarious. So, definitely. Okay, well, I'm going to give you uh, four minutes. Oh, one more. Fiona is working on an urban fantasy new adult novel. Super fun. Okay, I'm going to give you four minutes. You can grab water or uh, take a bio break before the next panel. Thank you all for coming and have a wonderful rest of your Author 2 Writers Conference. I'll be at the after party at 9 p.m. tonight and um, or the after work party, whichever. So uh, thank you for, for, for watching and I hope everyone in who's watching in the reruns enjoys. So.